Uh, welcome to, let me make sure I'm recording. Yes, last day of class. <sighs> um, so uh, today I have um, some jellyfish and we're kind of going back to the beginning here. Um, I have uh, some slides to show you. Um, I would like to show you these slides. Um, and then I can also uh, chat with you a little bit about the advanced examples, which are related to the slides. Um, if you have any questions, sort of general questions or code-focused questions that you wanted to ask, I'm happy to take some time out to discuss that with you. Also, like, I mean, it's our last day of class, so if you have any questions about anything, um, now's the time. So um, I think we could probably get started with questions, actually. I'd prefer to you know, focus on your concerns. Um, the slides are still gonna be there after today. Anybody have any questions or concerns that they want to ask? Really? Well, I did talk to quite a few people um, over the weekend and into early this week about um, code and uh, was able to help, uh, hopefully help quite a few people out with their code examples. Um, so mostly, most of the mistakes that everybody was making in the code were like just basic syntax mistakes. So like missing curly braces, missing semicolons, um, sometimes missing parentheses or having them maybe not nested correctly. I would say that was probably 90% of the people that I talked to um, were having uh, you know, code problems that were based on, on those sorts of errors. Um, so that's, you know, welcome to, welcome to coding. That's kind of how it, how it is. Um, so I'm gonna do one more call for uh, people that are just kind of getting in uh, for questions. Any questions about the P5 coding? Okay, um, well then let me go ahead and just get into the sort of scheduled slides. Um, we have uh, this sort of group of slides called Everyday Algorithms. Um, these slides are definitely gonna show up on the final exam, and when is your final exam again? It's the 22nd, it's all day. Let me just refresh your memory there. It is the 22nd, 24 hours. Um, so my next sort of thing that I'm gonna do with all of you is that I am going to um, go ahead and, if we have time today, I'll go ahead and do the final review. Um, I finished up the exam yesterday, um, but uh, I do wanna take some time to kind of like uh, look at some of these more, um, what I would consider to be kind of advanced topics in coding. Um, so what we're going to look at is coding, thinking about coding from a different sort of angle. We're not going to think so much today about actually doing code. We're going to be thinking about looking at code created objects. Um, and if we look out at the world at sort of uh, code or generative art objects, um, there are three or four uh, classes of algorithms that I've identified here for you as being sort of like the most popular algorithms used in code based art. Um, and it's sort of like looking at maybe like the crackle filter in Photoshop. Like once you see one of these algorithms and how it's made, you kind of can't unsee it. <laughs> um, and it, it will forever ruin um, generative art for you, or maybe not. Um, so these uh, algorithms in particular are sort of like the most overused. Um, and I, I say that they're overused, but they're also just, some of them are pretty foundational. Um, so, for example, an overused but foundational code concept is the idea of randomness. Um, and we've worked uh, a little bit in some of the sample uh, code that I put up on the website. There is randomness. And so this is like a really great um, video that actually contrasts randomness algorithms. But basically what you can see here is that if you ask a computer to pick a number between 1 and 100 and you ask them to do it randomly, there's sort of a sub-algorithm underneath the random function that is controlling that selection of one to 100. Um, and this is actually like what you get when you do uh, a true random call on a bitmap. So this is turning the pixel either on or off randomly. Um, and this is uh, what's called a pseudo-random function. 
And for most of the scripting languages that we're working with, including JavaScript, um, we're going to actually be getting something that's a little more pseudo-random. And so because it's pseudo-random, that's one of the reasons why when you use random numbers, you can start to kind of see patterns inside of them. Um, and it's, it's because there's some similarity in those, those numbers that are getting pulled. Um, and here you can see really clearly that there's like a sort of pattern within those choices to turn those pixels on and off. So some people like to think that as coders, we're all working with uh, pure randomness. Totally not true. Um, almost every contemporary code language uses pseudo-random numbers rather than random numbers. Um, so what you get, though, in terms of pseudo-random numbers, it kind of doesn't matter, and it saves the computer a whole lot of calculating time. Um, so it's a lot faster for the computer, and when you make sort of results like this, it, it kind of doesn't matter, and you would never see it. Um, this is a really famous sort of uh, starting kind of entry-level script called random walk, and it basically is what happens when you draw a line and then uh, take a quadrant of pixels, and then you draw a line at a random direction, 90-degree direction, and then you, you know, draw a random number of stops, and then you turn. Um, so that's like a really simple sort of way of, of using randomness in a way that looks a little bit different from this kind of two-dimensional approach, where this, in this approach, they're probably using two for loops to create a grid of pixels. Um, and here, it's sort of like directly controlling the uh, direction. So random uh, values are something that we can totally use in P5, and um, it's a great code tool. One of the ways that I talk about using randomness in my code class, um, which, by the way, I think is coming up this semester, this spring semester. I'm teaching Art 309, which is art and code. I think I have, like, two more seats left. Um, but the way I talk about randomness um, in coding has to do with sort of, like, I sometimes will joke about it being sort of, like, um, sprinkles, right? Like, it's sprinkles of not boringness. Um, in other words, uh, when you make something that is generatively created, let's say with just four loops and maybe iteration or dec um, uh, decrementing, it, um, it has a tendency to look very sort of like rectilinear, maybe based on straight lines and angles. And when you insert random numbers, it can tend to make something look a lot more organic and a lot less sort of synthetic. Um, and then, sort of secondly, uh, another like super huge um, algorithm that is used all over uh, digital work and especially generative art is um, the concept of noise. And so noise uh, doesn't actually have to do really necessarily with sound. Um, what we're looking at specifically is called Perlin noise. And Perlin noise was an algorithm that created pseudo, the, the goal of Perlin noise was to create pseudo-random numbers that had natural transitions between the low and the high values. So what you get is you get something looking like this, whereas if this were random, it would just be like a bunch of jagged lines, right? Um, and so Perlin noise was invented in the early 1980s, and it kind of took over the computer graphics world. Um, so this is one way that you can see Perlin noise being used. This is kind of the most basic way. Um, it's used a lot for two-dimensional textures. So if you're looking for like a bump texture or something like that, chances are that you have something uh, that's probably generated by Perlin noise. Um, it's also used to generate three-dimensional terrain if you have a Perlin noise on every axis, the X, Y, and the Z. Um, I can personally attest to sort of like using this method um, on the game project that I'm working on right now. The bottom layer of terrain, which is sort of like sand dunes, was generated using a Perlin noise algorithm in C sharp. Um, so it's really super common to see Perlin noise used in this three dimensional um, generative way. Um, it's also used a ton in uh, cinematic graphics for water sand, wind, basically anything that has kind of that natural pattern and a surface. Um, so artists right now out in the generative 
sort of art field are really using Perlin noise in a way that they haven't before. Um, they're using it to make you know, abstract work. Um, and so this is Marius Watts. He's a professor at the um, Oslo School of Architecture and works a lot with these sorts of blobby forms um, that are made exclusively with Perlin noise. Um, Another one of my favorite generative artists is Leonardo Salas, um, and he works almost exclusively with uh, Perlin noise-based algorithms. And here's another Leonardo Salas. Um, work is just really, really beautiful. Um, so yet another method uh, to sort of like think about kind of the big picture of how we're using these things um, recursion is another really big topic in computing, um, which we see in p5.js. We see it mostly in this type of uh, application, which is, um, I guess, a good way to describe recursion is maybe like making things out of other things. Um, and indeed, if we get into the um, advanced examples, there's a recursion example, and the the salient characteristic of re recursion is that you have a function, and as part of that function, it calls itself. Um, so you're basically constantly getting sort of like the next smallest thing um, in there, or in some cases, the next largest thing. So recursion is usually used to, um, again, sort of simulate certain natural patterns. Um, you can see here, it's great for trees, leaves, Anything that goes like that, <laughs> um, because you can take those two sides and then you can turn them into little branches. So um, there actually is an algorithm out there called an L tree, um, which is a really fun way of making trees with recursion. Um, and yeah, there's all kinds of ways of dealing with recursion. So you know, one thing that I like about recursion is that you can use um, in this case, there's probably only like one corner that's actually the algorithm, and the rest of this is just kind of iterated or sort of cut and paste to create this kind of texture. Um, here's, I've been waiting to show you this image for a while. Um, this is an image by uh, two artists. Um, so one of, um, I knew a curator from Berlin once who described this artist, John Powers, as um, a machine that converts beer into styrofoam sculpture. Um, <laughs> and it's not, too, it's not too far from the truth. Um, I mean, you can see this is like an enormous sculpture. Um, and he just uh, has done a bunch of these. And uh, sadly, if you Google John Powers, um, he had a piece in the, in the New York Times about him. Uh, within the last year, I think he, cut, he lost his hand. Um, or part of his hand in a power tool accident. Um, but hey, that's one thing that's not going to happen to you if you stick with coding. So don't worry about that. Um, but he is an amazing artist and you know, has been doing this sort of like analog but digital kind of form building for quite some time. Um, it's pretty well known in the art world. Um, and here's like a kind of almost like a cityscape type rendering of a recursive uh, two-dimensional algorithm. And then of course, there's a bunch of different categories of recursion. This is called circle packing. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this in like um, graphic design or even like textile design. There's like, I can probably think I've seen Ikea curtains that are you know done with this type of an algorithm. Um, so it's very sort of like widely out there, this kind of circle packing approach. Um, and it's very similar to like this type of an algorithm, but instead of actually creating these larger things, you're just sort of going through and filling holes um, with smaller objects. And of course, you can do this in a way that's like pretty sophisticated and pretty image-based. So there's a, sort of a a world in which generative art and image-based art kind of collide. Um, it's not a very big world, but it does happen. Um, and that usually can create some pretty stunning effects. Um, so the last algorithm that I want to chat about today is called Voronoi. 
And this is probably like the closest picture of Voronoi that I could find. Um, the Voronoi algorithm is also, uh, it's kind of a shorthand for what's called a Delaunay triangulation. So it's actually a math thing. And the good news is you don't have to know anything about Delaunay tri triangulation to use the Voronoi algorithm. Um, it's usually just already there um, waiting to be grabbed. Um, and I think people like the Voronoi algorithm because it creates this sort of like crystalline structure. Um, I've seen it out there in design um, and designed objects like a lot lately, like to the point that it's like, oh my god, you're killing me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, Adobe has also been kind of trying to um, deal with it um, through some of its uh, artwork. And there's actually, um, this guy was the uh, Adobe Artist of the Year, I think, for like 2018. And um, one of the things that I think is so interesting about his process is if you look at this stuff, it's actually sort of like based on the structure of a, a Voronoi algorithm, but he actually works over it with um, a tablet. Um, so it's this really compelling, uh, in my opinion, really compelling uh, kind of marriage of like generative art and the sort of like old school just drawing a thing. Um, so that being said, those are sort of like the five categories. And um, I have a few uh, examples that I can certainly show you. Um, so for randomness, I have this um, sketch over here. So this is 90% of the time, this is the kind of stuff that I would use randomness for. Um, and you can see right here, I'm just using the random function. So I could pump this up a little bit um, just by basically uh, the way random works, if we have not already covered it, is um, you get a low point and a high point. And that basically then becomes your sort of like the value that your random value will be drawn from. So if I shift this uh, high point up to five, st things are definitely gonna happen, as you can see, a little bit faster. Um, and yeah, that's basically like how randomness works. Um, we also have another random value here. Looks like that could get changed. Um, I'm not gonna kind of get into these too much, but I did wanna kind of show you that they're there. Um, we also, I have a, a sample of Perlin noise. Um, again, Perlin noise is something that I use a lot in my work. So this is just an example to show you how 1D Perlin noise uh, can be used. Um, but basically with Perlin noise, uh, what you're doing is there's one variable called the noise scale. That's kind of a baked into the cake. And then uh, here, you're basically using a for loop to pull values out of, um, out of the noisy, this noise value. And then you're using them to create curve vertices. So there are easier ways of using um, Perlin noise, but this is probably like the most useful basic example. Um, and then I have a little example for recursion as well. So this is the, this is the P, P5 example. And you can see, as promised, um, one of the sort of essential characteristics of the draw circle function, you can see the draw circle function is called here in draw. And so it calls it. And then uh, there's a variable called level, which is this, this is actually opting for six levels. So every time it calls the draw circle function, it actually calls itself a, you know, an additional time, seeing that it, checking that it's down to sort of the level that it should be at. So that's fun. And then uh, the Verona lab library, um, I didn't put an example uh, for Verona code, probably because it's even more advanced than I would say advanced stuff in this class would be. Um, so I put a link to the library. If you are an advanced coder, you could check it out. Um, there's two more sort of advanced examples that I just want to make you aware of because they would be something for you to potentially try um, in the future. So um, I have a sound example where um, because you're working in a web browser, of course, you have to allow the microphone. And 
I'm on a brand new laptop. Okay, here we go. So yeah, as you can see, this is taking sound input and it's writing it to a variable, right? So that variable could basically now be any number to control anything in my sketch, anything. Size, color, position, whatever. Um, so that's super fun. And uh, then you can also use the webcam uh, as part of p5.js, which is just something to think about. Again, because it's in the browser, you have to allow it. And now you can see I am using the webcam feed. Um, and so basically what you're doing, this is like the you know, 10 second introduction to video processing. Um, but what is a video at the most fundamental level, right? It's a frame with pixels. So what you're getting is a two dimensional array or a basically like a row and a column of pixels. So you can address each member of the row and the column with these two for loops. Um, and that's how you get at the individual pixels. Um, but probably in terms of like projects that you can do with P5, you know, using the camera, using the sound, um, are things that you can't necessarily do in other um, development environments. So that's fun. And I think that's kind of what I have for today. I would um, curious if y'all have any like last questions. I totally will do a final exam review today. Um, We've got plenty of time for that. Yeah. It's hard to know without actually kind of like knowing exactly what language you would be in or like, because I'm thinking that you would be using it maybe in C Sharp for some kind of Unity landscape creation. In that case, I would say that you could do it. Um, I mean, it probably would be some sort of like base algorithm for one river and then maybe a different algorithm for the tributaries um, that have different parameters, right? Um, but I guess my short answer is yes. <laughs> Any other sort of general questions? All right. Oof. Okay, well, so I think at this point, I might um, go ahead and go, uh, let's see, camera big. And I think I'm going to, Turn off this old video feed here. Oh, hello. Okay. And guess what? We have entered the final review portion of class. Okay. So the final exam, um, the first thing I'm going to be testing you on is uh, the name and beautifulness of my cat. No, joking. Not going to ask you about that. Um, but you might get to see him. There is a picture of my cat on the final. I found a way. I found a way to do it. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So the final has 20 questions. Um, none of them are directly about my cat. One of them sort of incidentally involves my cat. Um, I guess I can just go through them one by one and kind of let you know what sort of where they're coming from. Um, we have sort of some... If I just maybe navigate back to the home page real quickly. Do, do, do. Okay, so there's a couple of places where you can find examples or content related to the final exam. And uh, basically, the final exam covers completely um, the, uh, it starts off at week eight, which is um, sort of getting started with Rhino. 
and then it covers the Rhino and code portions of the class, okay? So if I'm kind of scrolling through this stuff right now, um, it looks like uh, there's some general conversation about, let me make sure I know which, um, so there's a lecture called the Class of 3D Modelers, NURBS versus Polygons. Um, that is something that you would definitely want to kind of bookmark as containing answers to the final exam. Um, so right now I'm looking at at least two uh, questions, probably three questions, that are around information coming from that uh, set of slides. So some of these questions are very specific, um, and I kind of can't really spill them without um, telling you exactly what they are. Um, but there are two questions about the difference between low poly and high poly models, um, and when or why you would want to use one or the other. Um, there's a couple of questions about uh, generative art. So there are some slides on sort of intro to coding for the arts. Um, that is sort of like the introduction to generative art and kind of where it comes from historically and all that. So there's a couple of questions about that. Um, there are multiple questions in this final exam that ask you to complete a set of code commands. My number one advice to you to complete those uh, questions is to cut and paste it into the editor of P5, and then you can see if you're right, like for 100% for sure. There's no question, um, other than probably just guessing. <laughs> you know, I don't, wouldn't recommend that you just guess. Um, so, because some of those, uh, some of these questions, the reason I'm saying it would be useful for you to, you know, cut and paste it into the P5 editor is that they're asking you, like, what's, maybe just say for the sake of argument, what's the difference between mouse pressed and mouse is pressed? Obviously, one will work in a certain context and one will not. <laughs> so, it's important to kind of uh, probably test out that difference. Um, there's a question about, uh, so there's two or three questions that are code-based that are short answer. Um, and they come directly from the course material. Um, one is about interaction, as I just mentioned, something having to do with the mouse. And the other is, I'm just going to say generally, the other one is about for loops. Um, and in particular, sort of identifying correctly the three components of a for loop. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, there are three or four questions about Rhino. And so some of those three or four questions have to do where they like show you a picture of how something was created, and maybe you just pick from a list, how did we get here? So let's say one was something like um, rotating a curve to create a surface, for example. You would basically be presented with that image and say what function was used to get this result. Um, so there are at least two of those sort of completion questions. And then um, there are a couple of questions uh, about like mm, kind of like what's kosher in Rhino. So we spend a lot of time talking about this one thing in Rhino and about how it's kind of important. Um, it rhymes with the word olid, <laughs> solid. <laughs> um, sorry, that didn't work out so well. It's, I'm pretty sure you knew what I was talking about. Um, yeah, so there is a question about like, what is a solid, why is it important? Yeah. And as I just continue to kind of go down here, um, there's a couple of questions about code, but the, um, these, and obviously, um, I just mentioned a couple of questions that were very specific. There's a question about um, sort of like general code practice. 
Like remember on the very first day we talked about some things like white space and comments and some of those kinds of things. Um, I would definitely review that. Um, so there is one image. Um, it's an image of my cat. And <laughs> that's not the learning objective, though. Um, the point is that uh, I'm asking you to download an image, and then you have to tell me how many pixels it has in it. In other words, what is the pixel size of this image? So that's kind of there for you. Um, there's a question about what common, and this is kind of like in the question, it's kind of, this should be a question that nobody misses, especially after I tell you what the answer is. Um, what common scripting language is p5.js based on? p5.js. Yes. <laughs> the answer is JavaScript. Um, so, okay, uh, so here's more, two more code questions. There's, um, and these are not short answer, these are multiple choice. There are two code questions about what the difference between setup and draw is. And kind of what they're for, what their function is. Um, there's a question about what is a variable. That's a great question. Um, you could find the answer to that in part two of the slides. And um, then there's a couple of questions um, taken from the slides that we literally just looked at, so I'm not gonna kind of itemize those. Um, but they're basically like, what type of algorithm, blah, 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 is used in this context that I literally just said? Um, and then, uh, Let's see. Then there's one last question about sort of artists um, and like a historically important artist to code-based work. So um, I don't know why this is the case, but I will say if you're looking for something to be happy about, uh, grades on the final exam are usually much better than grades on the midterm. Don't know why. Not by a lot, but they're better. So must just be like time of the semester or I don't know. Interesting, huh? So um, I'm going to entertain any last questions from y'all. Um, maybe one last thing I will mention before, while we're all just sort of still in the same room and on the same video, uh, video screen. Um, there are some uh, additional courses after this course that you could potentially take. Um, so you might already know about them. Um, as I said, I have maybe like one or two seats left in my code class for the fall. Uh, or for the spring. Um, my colleague Stephen Hilliard teaches uh, a class called Art 429 and 529, um, which are really sort of like based around digital animation uh, in the Maya um, sort of work environment. And yeah, there's all kinds of courses. So um, yeah, I would just like, you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, feel free to send me an email or put your feelers out with our academic advisors. And that being said, like, uh, have a wonderful semester. Um, and yeah, don't hesitate to call me if you're in the neighborhood. So um, I'm going to post this. I'll have the final exam review up this evening. And uh, I'll hopefully be seeing you all on the 22nd. Well, I mean, not literally, but you know, conceptually. Okay, well, thanks. Have a great rest of your time. Bye. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. Yes, today.